My name is Columbus Leo. I came from Taiwan, well, I was born in 1960s, and my family immigrated to Canada in 1974. A lot of Taiwanese people were scared uh, because the uh, Chinese KMT, they would, in, in Taiwan, they were still uh, very suppressive. It was actually uh, very brutal. People can be arbitrarily arrested, detained, uh, and many people got uh, lost their lives or <clears throat> were uh, imprisoned for 10, 20 years or lifetime. The general secretary of the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan, the very well-respected uh, Reverend Xi M. Gao, uh, some people uh, refer to him like the Bishop Tutu of Taiwan. He was arrested by the Chinese KMT, put in jail because he was um, <clears throat> supposedly tried to hide one of the fugitives that uh, was in a big rowdy, human rights rowdy. And when I heard that even he would be arrested, and later on I uh, also learned that uh, the Presbyterian Church in Canada they bestowed an honorary degree to him. So he was not able to come to Canada to receive that. Mm -hmm. But the Presbyterian Church in Canada stood with him. And I thought that was really brave. That was really good. It showed uh, solidarity with what he was doing. <clears throat> and so that was something that also I guess uh, help me to uh, affirm the belief that what he was doing, what Reverend God was doing, is right. And interestingly, <clears throat> there were Taiwanese student associations that were forming around North America because there was a time of a lot of the uh, students from Taiwan that uh, when they wanted a higher education, uh, they look to the U.S. So there were Taiwanese students forming, and the uh, Chinese came to uh, foreign post. Their agencies were also looking at those and want to suppress them. Basically, they wanted everyone to call themselves Chinese, not Taiwanese. Right. Chinese came to government wanted to suppress Taiwanese identity or even gathering of people calling themselves uh, Taiwanese or Taiwanese culture, they still wanted to spread the idea that Chinese culture, Chinese language is more superior. So that was a struggle for a lot of the Taiwanese uh, at the time. And when I was uh, encountering that, I thought we have to do things to break through the blacklist. Uh, Formosan Foremost Association for Public Affairs was one of them, uh, where we uh, uh, would to lobby work with the Canadian government, or maybe not necessarily a lobby or public affairs, uh, education work or the spreading a message. Uh, so I think I was fortunate to, uh, as I got more active, I was willing to also fly to places, to Washington DC to join meetings and got to know a lot of other people. I was one of the uh, youngest uh, around at the time, uh, in, in my 20s, when most of the people were in, in the middle ages or the older, and I learned a lot from uh, from them. I, I found out, see, there were so many people that were uh, willing to contribute, but not asking for something in return for themselves, not, not personally. And uh, we got more involved in we were able to uh, to get the World Federation Conference, which is held once a year in different parts of the world. Uh, we were uh, able to tell the leaders, hey, come to Canada. We are ready to host you. <laughs> I thought that would be good. Uh, it hasn't come to Canada for a few years. And me being active and uh, president of the local association in Toronto, uh, and working with the national president uh, who was also in Toronto at the time. And with him, we thought, yeah, let's do that. So in 1987, the World Conference came to Toronto. Actually, when it was in London, we chose the <laughs> Western University uh, as the site. 
And during that uh, meeting, we decided for the next year, 1988, we would go to Taiwan to hold the next year's conference. I also remember uh, having invited uh, the chair of the DPP to our uh, deciding meeting on how to proceed. We asked for their help. We would help them and how they could help us if we to go to Taiwan. We were discussing a possible backup site in case we couldn't really get to, into Taiwan because many people were blacklisted. But uh, the DPP chair told us, be decisive. Don't have a backup site because if you say we are going to have a backup site, say in Tokyo or in New York or something like that, you probably would end up going to that backup site. Be decisive and say, no, we are going back to Taiwan. And even if it turns out that just about everybody were held back from entering Taiwan and you couldn't hold the actual conference, so be it. Announced to the world, we tried, but the KMT stopped us. So I was in the core of the organizing the, uh, that endeavor. We were not sure if we could be successful. We knew there were risks. We knew many people were blacklisted. And uh, I also applied for visa to Taiwan at the time and found out, <laughs> lo and behold, I was blacklisted. I was denied the visa to go back to Taiwan. <laughs> and same with my wife. So that was also a time when many other people also found out the same thing, that they were uh, really blacklisted. <laughs> but we still tried. Anyway, I got in. I got into Taiwan and so did uh, quite a few other people, some with similar uh, ways, some there was a really feeling of wanting something better in Taiwan. The government's brutal suppression was still there, but people wanted to rise and break through that. So the, during that time, I could really taste firsthand those desire for change, desire for a better democratic uh, world. And we actually did successfully hold the conference in Taiwan at the time. Because the president himself couldn't be there, he appointed three alternates. I was number one in the list of alternates, and the other two, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, he also got in. He, he wasn't as noticeable, and yet another person also got in. So the three of us were there to try to make decisions uh, sometimes uh, important decisions on a flight. I somehow got thrust into this situation as a 28 year old young person uh, was there and on occasion kind of had to speak representing the WFTA because the president wasn't there and I was there. I, After the success of that particular conference, and in talking to the activists that were in Taiwan, we saw, gee, you know, we achieved something here. We should do that again next year. So you know, with all that and coming back to the Canada and uh, North America with, uh, with others, uh, after some reviews and discussion, we decided to do it again the next year, 1989, because in 1989, at the end of the, that year, there was the legislative election. Wow, it wasn't a true election because only 7% of the legislators was being re-elected, those representing Taiwan. The rest that represented different parts of the China, Beijing, Shanghai, Shandong, the Yunnan, all those places, even the, even Mongolia. Yes, Mongolia. Even though Mongolia is not part of China, <laughs> but Taiwan ROG still had Mongolian representatives. <laughs> yeah. So that was the last election at the end of 1989, and we felt we can continue to push the agenda. Uh, we wanted to continue to break through the blacklist. In 1989 came, I did get in Taiwan again. I wasn't sure if uh, Dr. Shen Yi was going to be there for our conference. We, so the morning of the conference, 
just as we were preparing for the opening ceremony, someone came to me and said, hey, Shen is here. I was so glad. I ran downstairs. I saw him coming in with another person, uh, I guess with a bag, and they took him to a change room so he can get changed into a suit. <laughs> so I didn't want to ask uh, how he got in there because of obviously he didn't come into Taiwan in a suit. <laughs> He's uh, while he was changing, I run upstairs to our the opening ceremony the site and I run in out to everybody. Hey, our president, Shendi, he is here. He's going to come in a few minutes. So the, everybody just erupted <laughs> in euphoria. Hey, we did something here. Our conference, we weren't sure if it was going to be successful. And so as a few minutes later, as Shen was coming in, he was uh, accompanied by another person, Dr. Bob Tsai from Houston. He was a the, um, <clears throat> director of the Wufi USA, Wufi World United Promotion for Independence. Uh, 2D KMT, th this is the seditious or treasonous organization uh, that's trying to push for Taiwan independence and trying to challenge the legitimacy of the Republic of China regime on Taiwan. So the two of them walked in. We had the uh, opening ceremony followed with a press conference with uh, so many reporters all wanted to get uh, a hold of the story that was breaking. Uh, These two very top of the blacklist persons got in Taiwan and were in this opening ceremony of the WTA conference. At first, many people thought, you know, the government seemed to have succe succeeded in blocking many of many blacklisted people from entering, but no, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> even bigger fish, <laughs> they come in. In addition to having this conference, we should organize a bus oh, tour so anyway. The, the 228 massacre for a long time was a taboo subject in Taiwan. But the first commemorative monument was going to be put up and open in just around that time. So the 1989 or August 19th, our two bus went there to join about 1,000 other people stand around that uh, uh, unveiling of that monument. It, it also marked another historical uh, first in Taiwan for that monument. So we were so heartfelt. Uh, uh, we felt it was important to be there. We were glad to be there. So that was the type of things uh, we did. You know, if we needed to change the uh, schedule or the route of our touring bus, we do that so that we can meet there on that day. And we continue to, our route uh, to different places. Uh, we made speeches and uh, ended up back in Taipei. And you know, during part of the, the trip, the, <coughs> the Chinese KMD issued an order that uh, Dr. Shen Li is not a welcome person in Taiwan you need to leave Taiwan within seven days. A couple of days later, the, uh, the Chinese Committee issued uh, another order saying uh, Columbus Leo, me and Bob Tai, you two are not welcome in Taiwan. You need to leave within seven days. We were going to leave anyway. We still have jobs. We still have to make a living and our flights were happened to be before the deadline of the seven days for us. But because KMT came with this order, I want to fight it. He wanted to fight it. So we, we decided together that we would overstay that order. Ye Jilan, the lady, certainly to come to our conference, show support, and she announced she was running to be legislator in the year-end legislative election. And we stayed at her place. Uh, 
she welcomed us and uh, it was also felt to be a safe place because the Chinese came team was seen as not going to dare to raid her place to arrest us in light of what had already happened. There was already a lot of outrage and sympathy toward her and what uh, Nai Long Chen has done. So uh, that brings back to the <clears throat> Bob Tsai and I continue to go to a few places to speak. So the, we cross the deadline. We continue to go out to speak. Two days after that deadline, uh, we were to be picked up to go to National Taiwan University to speak to graduate students who were interested in the particular situation in Taiwan and to meet with us. As Bob and Bob Tai and I stepped out and got into the car by our friend that was driving us, uh, three to four hundred police from around the laneways <laughs> stormed and surrounded us, <laughs> put a uh, put a big uh, carrot to stop the, the <clears throat> exhaust pipe lead into the car storing and uh, they just keep on banging the windows telling us to get out and our driver the uh, Dr. Lu Xiaoyi was at first saying it's okay if we don't get out and if they want to break the glasses let them like he was uh, courageous that went on for several minutes and eventually the only outside it became quiet and we saw someone kind of an official looking guy. You know, he was wearing the, a different um, <clears throat> hat. And besides him was someone kind of carrying the, maybe documents or whatever. So he stepped up to the just outside of Lushoi's place and wanted to talk to him. And he asked um, our driver Lushoi to roll down the window so, so they could talk. And Lushoi he did roll down the window so there's a little gap i guess they could hear each other a little bit better uh, but right at that time some other police behind him jumped because they had some sticks ready they immediately stick into the hole so you cannot <laughs> reclose the window and from there they came and begin to try to uh, begin to force it <clears throat> down and from there they spread tear gas into our car. We opened the uh, <clears throat> door, but as soon as the doors were open, the police also swam in, helped to keep the door open and drag Bob and I out. Uh, so both of us were uh, dragged and been lifted like a pig, four limbs, one on each limb, and we were each taken to a uh, uh, a police car rushed to the airport, ready to be deported. So that was 1989 August when we were deported. At the year end, uh, early December, there was the legislative uh, UN election plus the election of Taipei and Kaohsiung city councils. Not the mayor, but just the uh, councillors. I went back to Taiwan and I was going to speak in some rallies, uh, but unfortunately, uh, I was arrested as I was coming out of the church. Uh, I was beaten up, dragged through the laneway by a thunderbolt unit. Uh, it's like a SWAT unit. <coughs> beaten up and charged with uh, national security law. And soon after that, I was further charged with sedition for advocating Taiwan independence. And if convicted, it would have been a minimum lifetime, a minimum 10 years and up to lifetime. Yeah, there were risk. We, we still push for it. Um, I got arrested, uh, beaten up, tear gas, and now in prison and facing those charges. A lot of time the KMT was doing this as like killing the chicken to scare the monkey. They hope to also scare other people overseas 
blacklist from continuing to challenge or wanting to break through the, the blacklist. And it may have worked for some people because some people definitely would be affected, but many other people from overseas were angry at that. And I heard from some friends in Atlanta, they said um, they never held any protest rallies against the candidate's office before, but when they heard of my being arrested, they got really angry. So they went to hold the first protest rally there. They they challenged the blacklist. blacklist. So, so that was 1989-1990s time. The push for democratic changes just continued. And what we were doing, it brought overseas Taiwanese community and activists in Taiwan close together. We were able to, there were channels established, uh, better channels established for communication. We were uh, working together in many subjects and eventually led to, uh, at the end of 1990, my sedition case, uh, was pronounced uh, basically is the same. Oh, he is not uh, uh, conspiring to commit a sedition. Uh, that he was not doing that. Uh, but but he is uh, suspected of conspiring to incite uh, sedition or something like that. So my sedition charge was precedent setting in that. If you were advocating or expressing for Taiwan independence, it is no longer a crime. And end of 1992, there was election or re-election for the entire legis legislative chamber. <coughs> it was not, I wouldn't say that was the time Taiwan turned democratic. Although there was that election and there was the changing of that laws because there were so many other political prisoners, but they were eventually the, uh, released. Uh, but it was still an important point, 1992. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then in 1996, uh, Taiwan held its very first direct presidential election. Li uh, Denghui was elected by the people as the first president. And four years later, year 2000, the DPP's candidate, Chen shui was the first non-KMT person to be elected the presidency. So all of those were in the progress of Taiwan to become democratic. If they, if I, was, uh, I was happy to have been involved during that time and contributed a little over that effort. <laughs>